we're welcoming you to our session, which is on the topic of anterior aesthetics, predictability with implants, and we have two experts here on stage. My name's Irina Seiler. I'm the head of the Division of Fixed Prosthodontics and Biomaterials at the University of Geneva, and I will be co-moderating this session with my dear friend and long-term colleague, Arne Tappe. <laughs> Thank you, Irina. Yes, we're very excited to have you all here. My name is Arndt Happe from North Germany. I'm uh, doing implants in the office now for over 25 years and have an affiliation to university. And on top, I'm the um, German ambassador for the EAO, and so it's my great pleasure to welcome you to Berlin, such an exciting city that I visited now since I'm 18 years old when it was a divided city. And today we have also the invited country, Turkey, and uh, welcome everybody from Turkey. We have the biggest community uh, out of Turkey here in Berlin, so it's a pleasure to have you all here. Maybe you feel at home. Uh, so it's my great pleasure now to announce the speakers. It's um, Henny Myers from the Netherlands, and it's a pleasure because I'm living next to the Netherlands, uh, literally. Yeah. And we have Stefano Gracis from uh, Milano, from uh, Italy. And you have to note that the next meeting will be in Milan. So we have here the ambassador from Milan for the next meeting. And um, so you will um, talk about the topic, the and, topic the speaker, and the first speaker. So our topic is aesthetics in the anterior region. And the two lectures will focus first on the single unit situation in the anterior segment and then on the multiple unit situation in the anterior segment. What should we do? How should we proceed? How do we guarantee predictable aesthetic long-term outcomes, which is, I think, very important. And I'm very honored and pleased to announce our first speaker, Stefano Gracis from Milano, who has a practice really specialized on prosthodontics, who has uh, studied dental medicine at U University of Pennsylvania in the US, and has also specialized in prosthodontics in Seattle. So he's really an international expert in this field, he has then come back to Italy, got an acknowledgement of his degrees, and is now a private practitioner in Milano. But not only this, he was the president of IOP, the Italian Association of Prosthodontics, and also of the European Academy of Aesthetic Dentistry. He has a long-term experience, clinically and also scientifically, a very sound knowledge on the topic. So we're very pleased to have you here, Stefano. Thanks for accepting our invitation, and we're looking forward to your lecture. The stage is yours. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Irena and Arndt, for the introduction. Thank you to the AO board for the kind invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I acknowledge also the contribution of my partners in the office, Matteo Capelli and Isabella Rocchetta, the two surgeons. And before I start my lecture, I'd like to make just a disclosure. Bottom line is I'm not being paid to say what I'm saying. And, and I try to bring here my clinical experience of this uh, 30 plus years that I have spent treating patients. So I've been asked to speak about uh, what I think is important in order to uh, guarantee long-term success of the restorations in the anterior section, the aesthetic part of the mouth of our patients. And certainly, when you look at a case that did go well, that provided proper solution and satisfactory from all aspects, also from the aesthetic point of view, well, that is the outcome. That is the result of many factors that play the role. And if everything has been set up properly and managed properly during the treatment and after the treatment with maintenance recall visits, where, of course, plaque control is really extremely important, then you should expect a long-term outcome that will keep on being satisfactory. But this is not the rule all the times. And very often, we do see situations, clinical cases, where indeed the outcome, also from the aesthetic point of view, has been less than satisfactory. And at that point, it's important to ask what went wrong, because we need to understand what are the factors that have caused such an aesthetic failure, sometimes a biologic failure, 
in order to understand how to avoid them and how to plan the next case in such a way as to guarantee a better result, hopefully an aesthetically integrated result. And again, if you now look at all the factors that in a way are involved in uh, the remodel uh, remodeling of soft and hard tissues around implants, you see that there are many variables that we need to understand and have control on. There are variables that deal with implant placement, with the implant and abutment configuration, with the materials of the restorations that we then manufacture, and of course also with the prosthesis design and the protocols that we are using in order to create these restorations. And out of all these factors, you have a number of factors that deal more with the surgery and that, of course, imply the knowledge of certain biological principles. Together with my partner, Matteo Capelli, and also with a good friend of ours, Uli Grunder, Years ago, we made these publications in which we tried to highlight and point out what could be those factors that set the stage for the proper restoration. But I would say that the majority of the factors deal with prosthetics and with biomechanics. And again, as a prosthodontist, I must be aware of them, I must know them, I must handle them properly. And you know, I've always been curious, I've always tried to improve my clinical skills and knowledge, and the best way for me is to try to study the issue and write a publication in order to really get a hold of what is the topic about and what I need to know in order to improve the outcome of our treatment. And this uh, papers really set the stage for me to understand a lot of the things that I will try to explain to you today. Of course, we have limited time, and therefore, in this 25 minutes or so of my lecture, I decided to focus only on three aspects. First of all, the three-dimensional placement of the implant. Then, speak about a little bit uh, of the configuration in the connection between an abutment and an implant. And third, the protocol that I normally employ to manufacture an implant-supported restoration and how that can also affect the outcome. Now, speaking about 3D implant position, Recently, a very nice article was published on, publi on uh, Periodontology 2000 uh, by Danny Boozer and Wolf Belser, and I think it was a really well-written article that helps a lot understand what it means to place properly an implant into an implant site, and what are the issues that you need to take into account. The one statement that really hit me when I read this article is that, you know, the role that we as clinicians have in the success of the uh, treatment is huge. And many of the failures that we see, many of the failed outcomes, are really reconducible to our decisions and to our moves and our uh, therapies. So that's why it's so important to be knowledgeable about the topic before addressing such a critical treatment like the replacement of a missing tooth in the aesthetic zone. So speaking about proper 3D implant position, we need to understand what are the main issues to address when looking at the placement in the mesodistal dimension, in the buccolingual, and the apical coronal. And basically what I have learned over these years is that I should keep at least a millimeter and a half of distance between the implant and the neighboring tooth. I should try to have a couple of millimeters of bone buccal to the implant in order to guarantee stability of the, of the tissues, hard and soft. And I should plan about a four millimeter 
a, a vertical positioning of the implant head with respect to the anticipated level of the mucosal margin. So this is really what we need to understand if we want to set the stage for a successful aesthetic outcome. Now, I would like to point out a few things about the buccolingual positioning that very often I face is restoring implants which, if, which have an axis which is far too to the buccal. And having an implant positioned in the anterior portion of the mouth with a very buccal axis, it is a big challenge for a prosthodontist. Because as you see in this slide, the more the implant is tilted to the buccal, the more the tendency is for the mucosa to be pushed apically. And this, of course, creates a big uh, aesthetic uh, issue, especially if you're dealing with a central incisor. There is a very nice article that has been referred a lot, the one by Sue and Oscar, who is here today with us. And I think it's really very nice because it points out the issues related to the mucosal tunnel and what needs to be kept in mind when creating a restoration that has a proper profile. Because we need to understand how these soft tissues behave and therefore how much we can guide them, push them, and how we should develop the proper emergence profile of our restorations so that these restorations look credible. And what this article pointed out is how to analyze this tunnel, mucosal tunnel, and really divide the two areas, the critical contour by what is called the subcritical contour. Now, the critical contour is really the most coronal portion of the tunnel, which is about a millimeter in width, and really is what I need to play with in order to create the proper zenith of my restoration and the proper vertical level of my margin. And the principle is if I push on this coronal portion of the soft tissue, I will tend to my, uh, push the tissues apically. If I flatten it, the tissue will tend to collapse back on the restoration and therefore tend to go coronally. Now, the subcritical contour instead is the area apical to the critical contour all the way to the head of the implant, to the platform of the implant. This area exists if the tunnel is deep enough. If you have a very shallow vertical placement of the implant, then you will not have much of a, a soft tissue tunnel to play with. But if you place it about four millimeters from the margin, then you have this area where you can then develop the proper contour. Now, the contour of the restoration in this area can be, as you see here, concave, flat, or convex. Generally speaking, the early stages of healing of these soft tissues, my contours are very flat or even concave. I want to leave space for the soft tissues to mature and grow into, and then I will open up the profile of my restoration to guide these tissues, but within a biological sustainable limit, because I need to understand this quality of the tissue, how much room does it give me to actually push on it without getting to the point of causing a recession. Interproximally, I need to allow the tissue to fill in as much as possible, and then subsequently I can increase the mesodistal diameter of my uh, abutment or restoration to try to push the tissue against the neighboring tooth and therefore fill in the papilla area. This is something that we have learned for many, many years. It's a very, very old case that we did when we were still at the University in Seattle. And this shows extremely well what can be achieved by playing with the tissues, guiding them into creating the proper profile for the final restoration. Another issue related to an implant axis, which is to buckle, is the fact that I, as a prosthodontist, am called to now correct this uh, 
uh, this uh, inclination, and in severe cases, I may have to prepare so much the abutment that I can weaken it in the cervical area. Also, very often, the mucosal margin will be pushed apically, and therefore, there will be a difference with the contralateral tooth, and the grayness is going to come through. This is one of the reasons why, in some cases, we use white abutments. Nowadays, zirconia abutments. And this, again, goes back to many years ago, in which Ronnie Young did the research at the University, University of Zurich, where he demonstrated how you need to have at least three millimeters of thickness of soft tissue in order not to show through the grayness of a titanium abutment. If you have less than that, you better switch to a zirconia abutment. But at the same time, you need to be aware of the limitations of the materials when you're preparing these abutments on the buccal area. If you are preparing a titanium abutment, I would say that if you keep at least a, a 0.7 millimeter thickness in the cervical area of the abutment, you're still on the safe side. But with zirconia, you need to be a little bit more generous. And this means that sometimes you're not able to prepare as much as you would like in order to hide the margin of the restoration in the, sol the sulcus of the tunnel. This is really something that I keep very much in mind because otherwise the abutment may break under function. But when, again, speaking about correction of the buccal axis of an implant, you're talking about the choice that as a prosthodontist I have to make, whether I want to make a cement-retained restoration or a screw-retained restoration. We all know very well what are the positive and negative aspects of a cement-retained restoration. And at the same time, we are very well aware of what are the positive and negative aspects of a screw-retained restoration. Especially the last point, the fact that when I do a screw-retained restoration, I need to deal with the size of the screw. And over the years, I have changed implant systems also due to this factor, because having a large screw diameter will impose a large screw access hole. And this may interfere with aesthetics, but also with occlusion. So I definitely prefer systems where the diameter of the screw, or the abutment screw, is very limited, gives me much more freedom of action. And this is actually a big problem any time you're restoring small diameter implants, such as these two lateral incisors. And here, the right implant was perfect to do a, a screw-retained restoration, but the left one was just slightly too much to the buckle, and this created a huge challenge for me to create a restoration which was similar to the other one, because I had to do a cement retained restoration. There was no way to actually do cement uh, screw retained. And for this size of implants, there is no angulated screw channel that you can use. So here you see the challenges that we as prosthodontists have when even small mistakes are made in the buccolingual inclination of the implant. And as I said, for the right implant, I was able to do a screw retain restoration, so the restoration was glued to the abutment outside of the mouth and then screwed into place. But for the left implant, I had to do everything possible to ensure that all the cement that was used to cement the restoration to the abutment would be removed in order not to create biological problems later on. And this is a nine-year follow-up of these restorations that have remained stable over time. Another case where I had to think about cement retain retention. This is a patient with a thick phenotype. And in this case, this is the type of solution I use with a glass ceramic core, which was bonded to a customized abutment in metal, and then I had to cement permanently the restoration, which is a glass ceramic restoration with the composite resin, because temporary cements are just too opaque and not aesthetic. 
But again, it's extremely important to guarantee the stability of the screw that retains the abutment into position. And if that is the case, then you could expect an outcome like the one you see here 15 years later. Another case, this was one of the first single teeth that I did in my practice on a young woman. Nowadays, I would not place implants on such a young individual. And I was working with another surgeon back then, and here's the challenge, the challenge of having a buccally inclined implant, which uh, eventually caused two issues. First of all, the recession, but also you can see here a very nice example of a ankylosed implant while the rest of the dentition keeps on growing vertically. So 18 years later, the patient finally asked me to replace the restoration because she did not like the color. And looking at it, I was really tempted in telling her to remove the implant and start all over again, but she refused. So this is what I came up with in order to improve the aesthetics. We did a zirconia framework on which we baked pink ceramic, and then I did a glass ceramic uh, um, uh, crown, again, zirconia mesostructure, veneer with ceramic. And then I cemented this uh, after screwing the, the screw into position with a glass ionomer cement in order to imitate the soft tissue as well as possible because she did have a tendency to show uh, and you know, demonstrate the presence of this restoration. And this is the outcome of this new restoration a few years later, which again have remained stable over time. So I have the benefit of a screw retention, the abutment, but with the aesthetics of the cement retention. Now let's talk about the second issue, that of the implant abutment interface configuration. And here there are two aspects that we should address briefly. The difference between the reliability of an external versus internal configuration as far as the stability of the abutments, and the other side, whether it makes sense to use a platform switch system as opposed to a non-platform switch system. So speaking about external, I've used external hexes for many, many years, and I would say with great satisfaction, even in the aesthetic area. But there is no question about the fact that now the majority of the systems available on the market are internal connections. But again, it would be a mistake to consider all internal connections the same, because they are not the same. There are huge differences between systems. There are systems that are flat to flat. There are systems that are conical connection. And then you have systems that have no self-locking and situations where a system where you have self-locking. Index, no index. So here you have a variety of systems and configurations, but the objective is the same, stability of that interface and the need to make sure that there is no unsettling and unscrewing of the screw that keeps the two pieces together. Years ago, the AO contacted me to participate in a very difficult, gruesome exercise, which is the consensus conference. And this publication is actually the outcome of that discussion that we had in Switzerland for three days, and Irena was part of that with me. And in looking at all the literature and trying to make sense of what is important when dealing with single implant restorations, I did acknowledge the fact that abutment screw loosening was a major problem with external axes. At the same time, it was very clear to me that many of the studies that published this data did not use the proper protocols and did not introduce the high preloads necessary to guarantee the stability of that interface. And once they did that, then at that point, there was no issue anymore, even with external axes. And my personal experience with external axes, as I mentioned before, has been extremely positive because I followed the cookbook. I use the rules. I apply the proper torque. I make sure the occlusion is fine. And I follow the case over time in order to make sure that the situation remains stable. So this is a 15-year follow-up of a single implant restoration with an external X. And never once this restoration came loose. 
The other issue deals with platform switching. This has been a hot topic for many, many years. My question is, is it necessary and is it predictable? And again, when you look at all the literature published on it, you see that the current evidence does suggest that having platform switch brings beneficial uh, effects, but there are so many confounding factors that at the end you cannot create a direct relationship between the presence of a platform switch and stability of the soft and hard tissues. This is something, therefore, that you cannot take for granted. It's not necessarily a platform switch is better than a non-platform switch. And I can show you cases of non-platform switch systems that have maintained their stability over time anyway. So this is another topic for the discussion, if you wish. Last but not least is the protocol that I employ to do my procedures and my restoration. And again, the question is, does a repeated disconnection or reconnection affect the level of the hard and soft tissues around our implants? Because if you follow this protocol, you connect and disconnect the components a number of times. And then you hear about all the possible bad things that you're doing while connecting and disconnecting. So you're bringing bacterial contamination deep into the tunnel. You are setting up the stage to have recession, loss of bone around this implant. But is there scientific evidence for that as well? Well, again, we started with some animal studies, and then we moved on to clinical studies. And looking at them and reading also the meta-analysis and systematic reviews that have been published over these last few years, you understand that, again, it is not possible to isolate one variable and create a direct correlation between the two. And my personal considerations is that it is indeed true that with one-time abutments, you see less vertical bone and soft tissue changes, but from a clinical standpoint, it, you can hardly see the difference. You see it on a regular more than clinically. And platform switch implants, again, show a tendency of losing less bone than non-platform switch systems, but again, if everything else is kept equal, the differences are not so great. We still have no idea whether as you increase the number of disconnections and reconnections, you can expect more soft and hard tissue loss because, again, there are too many confounding factors that really do not allow us to make these clear, direct correlations. As you can see, implant level, site, phenotype, procedure retention, they all confound the picture. What I can tell you is that I have had to do a number of clinical cases where I needed to connect and disconnect in order to really play with the tissues, to guide them, to properly shape them in a way that would allow me to get the best aesthetic result. And I know how to do this, and I would not know how to do this without this protocol. So I do believe that keeping on connecting and disconnecting may be detrimental, but at the same time, if everything else is kept you know, under control, you may expect no consequence of that. At least this is what I've observed in my clinical practice. So here I come to the end of my talk, and I have tried to think how to leave you with a message that would help you understand how to address these type of clinical cases in your practice. Again, what I try to summarize are the major points that I always keep in mind when trying to restore an implant in the aesthetic area. Again, everything starts with the positioning of the implant in a proper site. This is absolutely mandatory. Uh, we use a lot of guided surgery to make sure that we are right on spot and we plan everything ahead of time very carefully. Uh, we use different implant systems because we have different guidelines to choose what is the best implant system for that particular patient. 
But at the end of the day, the only important thing for me is to apply the proper torque in order to guarantee screw stability over time. Flatten switching may be helpful, maybe not. And again, if possible, I would avoid multiple connections, disconnections, but sometimes I cannot do that. I cannot avoid it. So, you know, in the, in the past, I really gave a lot of credit and weight to these factors, you know, implant abutment connection, the replacement switch and repeated dis and reconnections. But over the years, I've come to realize that the factors that really impact on the outcome of my restorations are others. First of all, the site in which placing the implant, then the proper 3D placement, applying the proper torque and therefore introducing the right preload, and then having the proper profiles that support the tissues without causing a recession. By doing that, I can try to obtain a good result. And again, nobody forces us to place an implant to replace a missing tooth. We are still prosthodontists, we still have other options in our you know, armamentarium, and very often, when the patient is not ideal for implant positioning, I'd rather go that way than placing an implant at all costs. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Stefano. Thank you very much, Stefano. So ladies and gentlemen, did we promise too much? It's a great experienced clinician with a long-term view on the topic. Please don't forget to send us your questions so we can use them also, introduce them I in the there, discussion. Right? Yes, please, have a seat <laughs> over there. <laughs> and this is the time for the next topic. Yes, it's my um, very pleasure to announce Professor Meyer from the Netherlands. Um, please come to the stage and uh, he graduated from the University of Groningen in the Netherlands and did his PhD at Utrecht. And then he became a professor for implant prosthetics in 2006. And since 2012, he's also part of the certification committee of the EAO. So I'm not um, envy that you have to cover this topic, which is my nightmare in, my <laughs> in clinical practice. If you ask me what is a real challenge in implant dentistry, it's vertical bone augmentation and two adjacent implants in the aesthetic zone. So I'm really happy to have you here and um, I'm looking forward to your lecture. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. I don't have a, on this a screen. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, the scientific committee, thank you very much for the invitation. Dear moderators, it's an honor for me to be here on uh, stage. The topic of my presentation is replacing two neighboring anterior teeth. And we will have a discussion about cantilever preferred or not. Um, as said, uh, I'm working in Groningen at the Department of Restorative Dentistry and at the Department of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery, which are both part of the University Medical Center in Groningen. And for those who do not know, Groningen is in the northern part of the Netherlands, some 200 kilometers from Amsterdam. Uh, we have a 400-year-old university building and luckily a rather new uh, university hospital. Um, in the next 25 minutes, I'm going to present to you um, two missing central incisors, neighboring of course then, but also a missing central incisor and the lateral incisor. And next to this, we will also talk about failing neighboring teeth. But to start with, um, the challenging part, as you said, uh, Arndt, uh, was already of interest to us in the zeros of this, um, of this uh, millennium and this century. And we were already having uh, two PhD studies on this subject because it interested us. And the one-year results are published by uh, Nienke Tiepstra in 2011, and we had the, have the five-year results published by Wouter van Nimwegen in 2015. And I'm really proud to say that I'm going to present to you for the first time 
for an audience the 10 year results of these uh, studies. Uh, we acquired permission of the medical ethical uh, committee of our hospital and uh, the manuscript was accepted uh, this year and it's uh, only th this month it was uh, published online so it's all available uh, to you. Um, the initial study had the following uh, inclusion criteria. So I'd like to guide you through the 10 years uh, uh, study, uh, starting with two implants with two separate uh, restorations. Inclusion criteria were at least 18 years of age, um, with a missing incisor, canine or first premolar, two next to them. The teeth missing are adjacent, I said, and there must be sufficient space bone for installation of two adjacent implants, and if not, uh, in a separate session, a bone augmentation procedure was performed, or at the same time, at the implant insertion. And of course, the implant site must be free from in, uh, infection. And we had the following uh, exclusion, uh, exclusion criteria, medical and general contraindications for the surgical procedure, of course, periodontal disease, uh, no, having no uh, having heavy bruxism or pyrofunctional habits, no smoking, and n having no history of local radiotherapy. So this is what we call the university-based study. Very neat group. Uh, I must say that we used in those days um, a flat connection uh, with no platform switching and um, um, without, a platform, without a platform switching and uh, because simply, uh, and no conical connection, because simply it was not there in those days. We are talking about 2005, 2006, when we wrote the protocol. But what we did have was a titanium connection interface and already um, zirconia abutments for the color in the aesthetic region. Uh, this is an example uh, of the 10 years results, a photograph and uh, with a, an implant restoration in the position of the central incisors. And if you have a clear look, you can see some white color at the, uh, at the uh, border uh, between the marginal, uh, 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 marginal mucosa in the implant. So probably there has been some recession in those 10 years. But what's the most important is, I think we have a compromised inter-implant papilla um, uh, for this uh, patient. Um, originally, there were 20 patients in the group. And for some reasons, during those 10 years, we lost three of them. So we have each patient were having two implants, so we are talking about 34 implants um, during those 10 years. As you can read, the, we had a 100% implant survival, luckily. And the next thing is, we all also had no restorations lost. So we have a 100% restoration um, survival rate. Um, coming to peri-implant bone loss, um, we took the first radiograph with the definitive restoration, so not at implant placement, so with the definitive restoration. And then we are talking about uh, osseointegration period because we were very conventional those days. An, an osseointegration period of three months, three months with the provisional restorations. And then we make the definitive ones. And after one month after placement, we, made, uh, we make uh, the, the, uh, the first radiograph. And so this is, a, this is our time point we are counting from during those 10 years. Uh, and we make, uh, we make a division between the sites facing the other implants, so in between, as you see here, and at the site facing the, the neighboring tooth. And these are the results after 10 years. Um, so as you see, very limited bone loss during those 10 years, from placement of the definitive to 10 years very limited bone loss at both sides. Uh, talking about mid-facial marginal soft tissue level change, uh, only 0.28 millimeter recession the mean, and not a large standard deviation. Uh, papilla index. Uh, we use the criteria according to YEMT, 
Um, for those who are not familiar with that, it's score zero is no papilla formation, score one is less than half, score two is at least half of the papillas present, and then you have score three, which is the ideal situation. Um, well, score four is not uh, relevant, I think. Um, these are the scores. We made a division between the side uh, facing the other tooth, so we have um, 34 of those sites, and between the implants with 17 patients, we have already 17 papilla. And what you see at the implant tooth uh, position, mainly the scores are at uh, is our score two and score three, and I can live with that, I think, after 10 years. But what you see at the implant implant, so between the two restorations, we have mainly score zero and even in two patients score um, score zero and, uh, and mainly score one. So actually we're, we're not that happy uh, with, that, uh, with these numbers. It's ex absolutely not favorable. Um, also, we ask the patients to fill in the questionnaire after 10 years and to make it short, to summarize it, uh, we had a mean satisfaction score with a, a score from uh, 1 to 10, and that's the numbers that our children get at school, so that's very easy for everybody. And we had a number of questions about satisfaction with the crown and a number of questions about satisfaction with the mucosa uh, with a score from 0 to 4. And if you see, this is very favorable, I would say. Pa patients at 10 years are highly satisfied. Uh, a 9.3 on a scale from 1 to 10. And also satisfied, as you see, with the crown itself and with the mucosa. And that's a little strange, I would say. Um, of course, we did performed also uh, the pink ecstatic score and the white ecstatic uh, score, the modified one. And these are the numbers. And if you can see, it's um, the pink ecstatic score and the white ecstatic score, the possible values are from 0 to 10. And on the pink ecstatic score, so the mucosa, it's only 5.2 after 10 years. And that's absolutely not favorable uh, if you compare it uh, with single tooth replacement, I would say. Uh, so the general conclusions of this study after 10 years with two implants with separate crowns is well, while it is it's out of the article, while it is difficult to obtain sufficient inter-implant papillae and satisfactory, satisfactory pink ecstatic scores, the initial treatment results remain stable. I will come back to that. And the patients were satisfied with the results throughout the 10-year uh, period. Um, and this surprised us a little bit, uh, of course. And to go in detail about the compromise scores after 10 years, and that's, of course, the inter-implant papilla and the pink status scores, I will show you um, throughout the so one month, five years, and 10 years, I will show you the numbers for these compromised results. And as you see here at the implant tooth uh, with the papilla index, you see already at one month, we had score one and score uh, two for the main part. And, and also between the two implants, it was actually the same. So the result after 10 years was also present, already present at the start of the definitive restorations and after five years and after 10 years, but it remained stable. And that's what we also see with the pink aesthetic score. There has been always low pink aesthetic scores. So that's why we said in the conclusion of this manuscript, the initial treatment results remained stable. So, be aware, if this is your initial treatment result, please do not tell your patient that probably it's going to be any better the coming weeks or the next months, because it is not. It's going to be stable throughout the 10 years. So do not promise them that. This is what you will have after 10 years for this patient. And luckily, if you have a good initial result, it's also stable. So you don't have to be worried about having less papillae or a, a, a bad aesthetic score. So what you have in the beginning, you will have after 10 years, at least in this study. 
Next topic. Of course, uh, we had also patients missing a central incisor and a lateral incisor. And what to do with these uh, patients? And what we were, what interested us, if it was possible to have one implant with a crown and the cantilever. And also for these patients, it was a limited group, I will show you. Uh, we have the 10 years results, and also this one was published online this month. Uh, so also for these results, you are the first audience. Um, also in this manuscript, we performed a little set, well, we systematic review is never little. We performed a systematic review because it's a lot of work. We performed a systematic review and also um, in the manuscript, a prospective comparative pilot study. To start with, shortly, with the systematic review, we had the following PICO. Patients with two missing adjacent teeth in the aesthetic region. The intervention was a single implant supported two unit cantilever crown. Uh, the control group was a two solitary implant supporters crown. That's where we compare it with. And the primary outcome was implant survival, but also we analyzed a lot of outcomes, uh, usual outcomes you see in manuscripts. And totally, we found nine articles which could be included in 11 study groups, nine articles with 11 study groups, and three groups with 57 implants had an implant cantilever construction, and eight groups with 298 implants had two adjacent implants. We were a little bit surprised to find this, because we think, and also Arndt was thinking this, such a difficult, important and challenging imp important treatment option with so limited literature. It surprised us. But nevertheless, uh, to summarize this um, systematic, re uh, systematic review, implant survival at both groups, uh, implant cantilever group and the implant implant group, um, very high implant survival, only limited marginal bone level changes, also in these studies, the presence of papilla between, so between the cantilever and the crown and between the two uh, separate crowns were compromised. Um, there was hardly any professional opinion uh, reported. And also in these studies, patient satisfaction was very high. Uh, so the general conclusion of this systematic review uh, was the data shown from the limited, I would say, included studies in the systematic review indicate that single implant supported two unit, two unit cantilever crowns as well as two adjacent impl implant supported crowns show good implant survival rates on the short to midterm because there are lo long term data were that, that included in that systematic review and an excellent patient satisfaction. So in the um, we started also in the, the two PhD studies I showed you. We had also a group to compare with, small groups, uh, two separate uh, crowns, two, separate, uh, two implants with separate crowns, and one implant with a cantilever crown. And also in this study, the same implant system was used, so without conical connection and without platform switching. Um, there were only five patients in each group. Um, so it was called, in the beginning, one year result, it was called uh, test of principle. And now it's called pilot study after 10 years. Uh, in the implant cantilever group, five patients, you were talking about five implants, of course. And in the implant implant group with five patients, we're talking about 10 implants. Also in these groups, 100% uh, uh, survival rate of the implants and also of the restorations. So that's fine. Um, very limited peri-implant bone loss, so also with the implant cantilever crowns, so it does not have an effect in those small groups um, on uh, peri-implant bone loss, very limited, and also the mid marginal soft TV level, level, even a little bit of gain in those years, but there are small groups, so please don't take it too much attention. And also what we see in those groups, the papilla index, uh, it's compromised also between uh, two, uh, two separate crowns, but also between the crown and the cantilever. So making a cantilever does not give you, um, uh, give, does not give you a papilla. 
but it's also not disturbed. And patient satisfaction also in these groups were very high. Um, and also the PES uh, was also in these groups um, very uh, low, I would say. So the general conclusion of the comparative study was that actually, to make it short, there was no difference between the groups. So cantilever is possible. Um, please note that we, although we didn't lose the restoration, there were some technical complications, and that's important, of course. Uh, once we had, uh, or twice, we had a, a restoration screw became loose, we had some chipping, but restorations were not lost. We could retighten the screws, and we, with a little bit of polishing, the crown was okay for the patient. In both groups, I would say, also for the uh, cantilever. And that surprised us a little bit, because we think one implant with a crown with a cantilever, there is much more loading. You try to have it out of conclusion, but there, there can be some loading, and you can say if it's, if it's really strong enough. Uh, luckily, we came across a study um, of the group of Irena Seiler, which had, who had the same framework of Ciconia as we had in our clinical uh, study 10 years ago. And they, uh, and they did some in vitro tests with it, and they concluded that the Ciconia framework is strong enough in the clinical situ situation. And that's why I think we did not lose any restoration. Ciconia is strong enough although it was covered with porcelain. Um, I know we are living in an era of immediate placement and immediate restoration, because the two groups I've showed you were conventional ones. Uh, we live in an era of immediate placement, either or not a combination with an immediate restoration. And also, we try to do this also with two neighboring teeth. This lady is going to lose um, the two central incisors, short patient case. Uh, Jerry Rachubar, my colleague, is, um, has treated this uh, patient, carefully uh, removing the uh, teeth, checking the buccal bone wall if there is no defect, putting in the implant a little bit of space, two millimeters, at the buccal side to fill it in with a bone of the patient itself and a bone substitute, because we know that will be the new buccal bone layer, not the initial thin buccal bone layer we had, because that is going to resorb. Putting in two implants, connective tissue graft, um, because we had enough uh, initial stability, provisionals were made and placed the same day, as you see here. And it's always nice to see that we have the screw access holes at the palatal side. Um, this is after two weeks, and this is after three months. And if you remove the uh, provisionals, this is the look at the implants. And this is the at placement of the definitive restorations. And if you believe in our studies, and I think this also counts for immediate restoration and immediate um, placement, this is the initial result. I think it will be stable throughout at least 10 years. There's a little bit of a compromised papilla, if you see. This will be stable. It will not get any better. It will not get any worse. And this is after one year, and this is after five years. I think stable results. Uh, and and uh, Wouter van Nimwegen published for two failing, um, rest of two failing uh, teeth the following guideline, published it. If the teeth is still present, there is no bone defect. We follow the guideline of removal of teeth, teeth. Uh, insertion of the two implants, and we, at the same day, we place the provisional implant restorations out of occlusion, of course. Um, and if there is a bone defect, uh, there was performed an alveolar ridge preservation, and then after three months, we have the insertion of the implant and the, at the same day, the provisionals. Last case. How do we approach in the clinical situation uh, whether or not to place implants at, at the position of all teeth or start thinking about implants with, implant, with uh, cantilever crowns? This is the patient. He had an accident some years ago. He was still then too young to have um, uh, implant dentistry. 
Um, some orthodontics has been done. Um, and he was wearing a removable uh, partial denture and he was sent to our office and they, with the question, please make a treatment plan and carry it out. Um, as you can see, perhaps on the radiograph, the central incisor, which is still present, their attachment level is a little bit low and we cannot use that if we want um, papillae. It will be already compromised, so it also will be compromised uh, if you ha have already a low attachment level. And if you're looking in the position 2, 3, the cuspid, there is um, some internal resorption. So we cannot use this uh, one either. So what we did, we removed the central incisor and the cuspid. And because a lot of bone was lost in the first session, uh, a bone augmentation procedure was performed. And then after three months, uh, we make a treatment planning. To start with the idea, having for each last tooth an implant. So what we do here, we try to place in the planning five implants. And if they are becoming too close to each other or too close to, the, to a natural tooth, we start, as you see here, we start thinking about uh, alternatives. And of course, alternatives for placing five implants is placing three implants. One in the cuspid region, and then in the position of the central incisors, and then having a crown with a cantilever, crown with a cantilever. And so we did in this uh, patient. Uh, implants were placed with initial stability, and at the same uh, day we placed uh, the provisionals, so also the provisionals with a crown and the cantilever. And this is the situation with the definitives. Uh, and what you see here at the position 1-1, one, one, we have the implant, then a cantilever in the uh, the, at the lateral incisor, also one implant at the position 2-1 with a cantilever and a separate crown on the uh, cuspid. And if you have a, a view on this, you see again compromised papilla, I would, think, I would say, between the implants, but also between the, uh, in, between the crown and the cantilever. But we know from our 10 year studies, if this is the initial result, it is going to be stable. And the patient was very satisfied with this. And if you were thinking we were coming from the initial situation with a lot of buccal bone loss, and we placed those implants and had a uh, crown with cantilevers, I think as if, uh, at the same, uh, as the same as the patient, we must be satisfied uh, with it. So the general conclusion of this literature, and I have 20 seconds, there is limited literature, and it surprised us, on replacing two neighboring teeth in the aesthetic zone. It's difficult to obtain sufficient inter-implant papillae and satisfactory uh, pink aesthetic uh, scores. Yeah, and this one is important. It initial treatment results remain stable and patients stay satisfied with the final result throughout the 10 years follow-up period. And we think if there's not enough space, a single implant supported cantilever crown in the aesthetic zone can be a viable uh, alternative to the placing of adjacent single implant crowns. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Henny. Please join us here for the discussion. We have received really excellent questions by our audience. And uh, it's really, uh, I would say, impressive to see the long-term documentation of all these cases that you Thank have you. Yeah. in Groningen. Where do you want me? First one? Yeah. yeah yes. Thank you. So when we, uh, as I was thinking, <laughs> we have a lot of questions from the audience regarding this concept. And I think we start with your lecture, Henny. Um, congratulations, great lecture, by the way. And uh, people are asking, um, for example, is the concept associated with um, soft tissue augmentation? Did you augment soft tissue? And they ask, what kind of implant system did you use? And last question, um, if you have two teeth missing, for example, central lateral, where do you place the implant? Always in the central position? Um, I'm a uh, prosthodontist, so don't ask me too much questions about uh, soft tissue augmentations. <laughs> um, my colleague says um, 
if, if you're needed, if you have some recession, we always perform, perform a connective tissue graft. Sometimes to have a little bit of more height, uh, but also for, to have more volume. But be aware, we know for, from other studies, it also will vanish in some years. Uh, don't expect too much for soft stiff tissue augmentations. Probably you will gain about a millimeter. But if you want to gain a millimeter, and that's enhancing your aesthetic results, please do. Second question was, oh, what kind of implant system? Um, yeah, we have a young audience uh, here, I think. Uh, can I say a brand? Yeah, they are asking about it. It was, it was a bone level implant. It was from Nobel. It is Noble Replace, but not the CC version, the Replace uh, version. And uh, it was very popular in the zeros, as my daughter says, of this uh, century. Um, so internal connection. And it is an internal yeah. connection with a uh, titanium interface. Yeah, and we were lucky to have already um, zirconia abutments for the color, of course. And what, what would you consider the smallest diameter you can use for this concept? Or what is the, the diameter you usually use it, to put yeah, it that way? Yeah, okay, that, that's about a central, inci uh, central incisor and a lateral incisor. Uh, to answer your first question, we always put um, the implant in the position of the central incisor because um, if you're thinking about occlusion, we have a guidance uh, uh, on the uh, central incisor and on the cuspid, and you can leave uh, the lateral incisor out, out of conclusion or a light contact. And it's very difficult to do that in the position of the um, lateral incisor. And on the other hand, for some reason, I don't know, if you're putting the implant in the lateral incisor, probably you're going to use a small diameter and to have all the forces on the small di diameter. Possibly it can be done, but there is absolutely no research on it. So don't try this at home, I would say. Henny, I have another question to this concept. You know, you have nicely shown that we can reduce the number of implants in the anterior region. But you've also nicely shown whatever we do, and maybe we as professionals are not 100% satisfied, the patients are happy. So if you reduce the number of implants, you reduce the costs of the treatment as well, so the patients be even more happy. Yeah, I would, uh, I would have, uh, <laughs> yeah, nice question. Um, we simply don't uh, argue with patients about the number of, uh, uh, number of implants because th this is a treatment uh, concept, which we never say if you, if you use one, it's cheaper than uh, two, two, because they have the general idea if there's enough place uh, with enough space between the two implants and uh, to the natural tooth, please use uh, two implants, uh, a regular size one, regular diameter and a small diameter, and make two separate crowns. But if, if there is some chipping, you don't, you only have to replace one or polish uh, one. The question is, patients are always happy. Um, actually, we wrote an article on that because it surprised us also. Um, Apparently, we are looking at other variables than a patient. A patient has, has mostly, uh, if you're missing two or more tooth, and the remaining part is, uh, is, is there, you're com coming out of some trauma. And I think the patient is already happy if you're doing well within your gui guidelines, of course, if we perform a, a, a well-based uh, treatment. And still we are looking, and so he's happy with the final results, we are all looking at those compromised papilla, not score three, but score two. But for the patient, probably that's not important. I do not mean that we can do everything because I have, and we have our own style and to perform the best treatment results, but, but luckily, yeah. Lucky you, you were happy, obviously, happy patients in Netherlands. <laughs> don't, don't, you, don't you have in Switzerland then? Definitely. <laughs> but I think most happy patients in Milano with these nice aesthetic outcomes. And you, you're showing a, a clear protocol of how you approach your patients. It's very prosthetically oriented. And the same, I think, also for you, Henny. 
coming back to the digital technologies today, they could help us be more efficient on one way. Do you ever use titanium bases and cantilever restoration supported by titanium bases in these kinds of indications? Uh, yes, we, we, yeah, it, 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 you, you mean the titanium bases? We've used them here also, but uh, not as you mean with the uh, bone level and the platform switching. Personally, I hate them uh, because I like to have personalized um, small abutment, uh, titanium uh, abutments, small, and then have the, um, the zirconia with the porcelain glued to it and have screw retained uh, mm -hmm. uh, things, uh, screw retained restoration. But I know that. And yeah, luckily I'm working at the university and at the university hospital. And th if they think this is our protocol, it's okay. But I know in general practice, um, the bill from your lab will be cheaper if you're using titanium bases, which are just, uh, um, well, stock abutments, I would say. And sometimes there's only one size. Uh, actually, I hate this, but I know it's done very much. Yes. So coming to the single unit side, and Stefano, you showed nicely that contouring the soft tissues is one critical aspect of having nice aesthetic outcomes in the anterior segment. Don't you think that with digital technologies today, you can already design the submucosal contour ideally and then have maybe customized healing abutments where you don't need to mount and demount the provisional for so many steps to contour the soft tissues? Well, the thing is, um, you know, the, the protocol varies on a number of situations, whether you're doing implants two stages or a single stage, first of all. But generally speaking, when we uncover an implant, what I like to do is to actually allow as much soft tissue to grow in as possible, which means initially I will place either a heating abutment or a provisional restoration, which is much smaller than the expected and finalized final um, diameter in order to allow the tissue to fill in. And at that point, I am forced to do these multiple connections, these connections, in order to increase uh, gradually the profile. And once I do that and I get a satisfactory result, when I take the final impression, I always, you know, right nowadays we're using most of the times digital impressions. I take the scan of the provisional into place and then I take the scan of the provisional outside of the mouth so that the definitive restoration can replicate exactly the profile that I was able to customize. Um, so, you know, but not all cases are like that. Some cases you can plan ahead and you can place a customized abutment at the time of implant placement, especially if you're doing this uh, post extraction. And what we have found that is that indeed uh, to place the provisional on an uh, immediate placed implant post extraction really helps a lot to sustain and maintain the soft tissues because you're providing a seal to the socket and in a way you are preventing uh, the wound to close in such a way that will in a way pull the fibers and then decrease the buccolingual thickness of the, of the site. So when we do immediate post-immediate extraction, post-immediate placement after extraction, we routinely place provisions which have more or less the finalized uh, profile. So when you place a temporary, you're not under contour this? Do you augment soft tissue or not? Well, you again, it depends. You know, again, you're talking about post-extraction right now or you're talking about uh, placing into a healed site? You know, there are two different... Placing situations. into a healed site, would you consider the... the the prof yeah, it makes a difference, of course. If you place your implant in a fresh extraction socket, you do a soft tissue augmentation, you need space for the soft tissue. So you, you go with yeah. an under-controlled abutment? We have found, for example, that uh, the shield technique is helping in maintaining and preserving the bone architecture. And therefore, in those cases, we may not place uh, soft tissue um, uh, grafts. In other situations, we do. I don't do the surgery, I only deal with the prosthetics again, so I can give you limited, uh, um, you know, direct experience. Um, but uh, certainly whenever it's possible, we do post-extraction immediate placement and provisionalization. Instead, in heal sites, 
I would say, almost every time we need to do some sort of augmentation. But in this case, we plan everything ahead. And we are very careful about the planning. And you know, we take the digital impression, we take the CBCT, and then we are able to understand how much volume needs to be added. OK, so can you specify this a little bit more for our colleagues, both of you, the selection criteria for the cases, for these yeah. respective uh, concepts? Maybe starting from the single unit gap. Heal site. Healed site or extraction site? How do you select the patient for the respective procedures and also prosthetic procedures and components? Well, again, the first part is to plan. Plan means collecting data. So uh, digital impression, uh, radiographs, 2D, but especially 3D, so CBCT. Um, where teeth are missing, we do a virtual wax up. So we are able to understand whether the implant placed prosthetically, so prosthetically driven implant placement, also needs augmentation. Hard or soft depends also from what we see on the, on the x-ray. I would say that most of the time we feel more confident doing guided surgery in these uh, critical areas, aesthetic areas. So that has become a routine. It does increase the cost for the patient. There is no question about it. Uh, and it requires a lot of time in the planning stage, but at the end, uh, you have less surprises. So again, if you're talking about critical area, like the aesthetic area is, you know, uh, there is additional investment of time on our side, of money on the patient side. One question from the audience wa was, how deep do you place the implant? What is the insertion depth? Of well, in the past, we used to use the three millimeter guideline Nowadays, for bone level implants, we tend to use four millimeters instead. Generally speaking, nowadays, we tend to use internal connections, not any more external connection in the single unit anterior area. Uh, frankly, I would not go deeper than four millimeters, but it's four millimeters for the, from the anticipated mucosal line. So you need to understand how the soft tissues are going to change over time. Um, again, it's very important to then guarantee stability of the screw, which means applying the proper torque eventually, and having this gap, uh, the micro gap uh, between the abutment and the implant, at bone level or even subcrestal, has not become an issue once everything is, is stable. I, one question was about soft tissue implants. We do not use soft tissue level implants in the anterior region. Maybe it's because you know, I, as a prosthodontist, like to have the flexibility that a bone level implant gives me. I have less flexibility with soft tissue level right. implants. Maybe. Maybe the same to Henny. Is this also the criteria that you would apply for your selection? Yeah, but, but to come first to the, to the depth of the implant. Yeah. If you're having one implant and you take three millimeter because, uh, uh, with respect to the future mucosal uh, border, you use three or four implants, but I did the certification today, and many of the implants for single tooth replacement were placed at five millimeters or even six. Mm. And um, most of the times we had a, a, a well, harmonious uh, um, mucosal level because also the mucosa is uh, held up by the um, uh, attachment level of the neighboring teeth. But if you have two implants, you don't have a connective tissue level uh, between two implants. So if you place them too deep, you, you will have a recession for sure. Uh, so uh, with two, two implants, just be careful. Take three millimeter or four millimeter, but not five or six. And uh, the sequence order, of course, we do a planning, uh, decide the number of implants. And if there's too less space uh, for two, we make one in the cantilever. Um, we try to do, if the um, teeth are still present, to do immediate placement, immediate restoration. But if not, we are doing an alveolar ridge preservation. Or if the uh, tooth are not present anymore, probably we have to do a bone augmentation procedure. And then we'll be putting in the implants. And if it's possible, um, if we have primary stability, we do the provisionals the same day for three months, and in those three months we have an osseointegration period and the maturation of the soft tissues, and then after three months we make the definitives. We are not doing it any longer because we know from research after three months 
this not happen anymore. But if, I, if I can add one thing, the depth of the placement of the, uh, of the implant is also related to the diameter of the tooth at the emergence. Mm. Right. So the more discrepancy there is between the diameter of the implant and the diameter of the tooth, the deeper we tend to place the implant. If there is not much of a, of a difference, like in a lateral incisor, you can be a little bit more superficial. A little bit more means three, two and a half to three. But maybe not. also the nature of the connection. Is it conical or do you have a Again, connection? You know, uh, you know, of course, when you do external axes, you are crestal or super crestal. There is no question about it. But one more question. So the, the only factor is the, the, the size of the gap between if you go for one implant with a cantilever or two implants? Are there other factors like soft tissue types, galloping, uh, may, bite, uh, occlusion? Mainly, mainly the space we have mm -hmm. in an ideal occlusal uh, setup. It's the main part, I think. And then you have fo to follow the guidelines of which Sivana showed us, especially the buccolingual position, because if you're mi missing multiple uh, teeth, you tend to place them a little bit too buckly to do not have an augmentation procedure. Plus, please do the augmentation procedure if it's necessary. There is an interesting question here when it comes to the two tooth gap. Would you also consider one single implant with a crown and then a resin bonded bridge next to it as an alternative concept to your cantilever implant restoration? Resin so bonded to the canine, for example, so you can also bond the lateral incisor to the canine? I, I, I hate that to make uh, bridges. <laughs> um, on the implants, bridges. I hate that. Uh, because of the access for dental hygiene, but also because of if you're making single unit, either or not with a cantilever, you have, um, you have the, the full space of the conical connection to connect the crown. And if you're playing with multiple, uh, multiple units, the lab will uh, shorten your conical connection. And in the end, there's not, because I think it's not possible to have exact parallelism of two implants or even more. So and we're talking about adhesive bridge on the canine? Just adhesively fixed? Yeah, not, it not could prepped. be done. It could, it could yeah. be done, of course. But hey, I'm working at the implant uh, department. I'm, I'm <laughs> seeing implants. <laughs> <laughs> There's a slight bias, I would say, right? Yeah, sure. <laughs> the whole Congress, I would say. That's true. Yeah, but happy patient. That's the most important. <laughs> There was there also, also a question, are we safe when the a case goes to court? Is, the, is this a concept implant with a cantilever that is recommended scientifically? If they ask me, with the limited research we have, but with 10 years results now, I think, yes, I can defend this. Okay. I will do that. That's Please good. ask me. <laughs> I think before we go to the concluding slides, Arndt, one last question which was raised several times is how do you cement the restorations in these critically heavily prepared abutments in cases where the implant is not ideally placed? If they're referring to the lateral incisor that I did on that patient, I use a permanent cement. I do not like to use resin cements because they're extremely hard to remove and you don't see them at the end. So generally speaking, I use either a glass ionomer or a resin modified glass ionomer, which once hardened pops off much uh, more easily. But I always place a retraction cord before cementing as an effort to try to make sure that I do not leave any remnants. But that, those are the type of cements that I like. Okay, excellent. So Arndt, should we go to the concluding slide in the last minute? Yes, uh, we prepared a conclusion for this session. Um, where we wrap it all up. So, thank you. There you go. You want to read this to us, Irina? Proper planning of implant supported restorations and the appropriate prosthetically oriented 3D position are crucial for aesthetic long term success. Sufficient bone volume and anatomically correct architecture of the bone are needed as well. Um, when it comes to soft tissue, then we need good soft tissue thickness and quality. They are relevant, and at crest level, the shape of the transmucosal components should not be larger than the diameter of the implants, uh, which specifically is the case in bone level implants, not to push away the tissues, but to give them space to develop. The emergence profile should be, I would say, could be developed with the provisional restoration in aesthetically demanding situations, or you go immediately into the right shape. 
I think this is a major difference between the two concepts. I think for a single tooth, you know, don't necessarily need an um, provision only in demanding situations, but if you have two uh, adjacent implants, it's a different story. There is no concluding evidence on the repeated connection and disconnection of components from the implant to cause permanent damage of the peri-implant tissues, but it's of obvious that we should try to minimize the disconnections as much as possible. So this is specifically the concluding statements, I would say for both lectures, but specifically focusing on the one single tooth gap, the stability of the implant abutment connection is relevant for the longevity. Now, aren't when it comes to multiple units? Yeah, we have another um, concluding statement um, that refers to the multiple units, which uh, Rosa Maya showed us. There's limited literature on replacing two neighboring teeth in the aesthetic zone. Still, it's difficult to obtain sufficient inter-implant uh, papilla and satisfactory pink aesthetic score, so it's still it's not really predictable. Initial treatment results seem to stay, uh, remain stable over time. That's what you showed in your 10-year study, and patients stay satisfied with the final results throughout the 10-year period. A single implant-supported cantilever crown in the aesthetic zone can be a viable alternative to the placement of two adjacent single implant crowns. Um, and I think this is it for this session. So I would say a big hand to our two great lecturers with their long-term experience, with clear conclusions. <laughs>